And good morning and hello everyone and welcome to a new episode. Today we have Denise Franco, she's one of my colleagues and she's doing her internal medicine residency here in Ottawa. She's an inter international medical graduate uh, with a huge experience and background and very inspiring story to share with us today. Hello, Denise. Hi, Ruping. Thank you for the introduction. I am very happy to be here. Um, I am excited. Yeah, I'm excited too. So like you went through a lot and we worked together in CTU and it was really a pleasure having you. Like you were really hardworking and really a great example um, of a, like, a very great resident. So why we don't get started? And tell me a bit about like yourself, your background. Where did you do med school? <laughs> you just made me remember those days in CTU. That was <laughs> very hard. Um, in med school, I did med school in, in Mexico initially. Um, in Mexico, we don't we don't do uh, undergrad. So after mm -hmm. high school, you go right away to med school. Um, we do two years of being in the school and um, in the classroom, then three years of uh, broad-based rotation. Okay. Then after that, um, after you finish those five years, you do one year of broad-based internship, which is like a like an R1, but of everything. You do gynecology, emerge, uh, internal med. Mm -hmm. um, surgery and then mm -hmm. after that you do one year of rural community service mm -hmm. where you are the family doctor of a small community so I did com complete total seven years and I graduated in 2017. Wow awesome so you finish your med school and then Canada comes tell me after finishing med school or like during med school did you, when did you write the exams? How was it? What did you use to prepare? Yeah, so I graduated in 2017 and I mm -hmm. did not uh, do the exams until then. Um, when I came in Canada around that, that year, I started uh, working on my exams. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote the CCQ one first. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, I wrote the Nakovsky. So mm -hmm. the MCCQ one, why did I use? I used the uh, Toronto notes. Mm -hmm. I also use uh, step one and step two first date. Mm -hmm. So the books for the US USMLE, although I, I didn't do them. Mm -hmm. um, in several question banks, I actually uh, found that the U world was very useful for me to understand um, the North American way of, of, of practicing medicine. Yep. And also, uh, there's another Q Bank, which is like uh, specifically for Canada, which is Canada Q Bank. Mm -hmm. I did found some mistakes on that Q Bank, but I feel like overall it's a, it's a good resource to understand how how they will ask the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for the Nakovsky, I took a preparatory course called Ontario IMG School. Mm -hmm. I think. This course helped me not not only in, in, in teaching me which uh, cases were the most useful, but also uh, meeting more IMGs. And mm -hmm. as I met more IMGs, it was very easy for me to go and, and practice with them in a daily basis. And I feel like that's what helped me the most in getting a good score in Anakoski. There's also this book that I used. It's called Strategies for the MCC QE2, which is mm -hmm. specifically for QE2, but it's actually very helpful for Narkovsky because it tells you how to approach very common cases like chest pain, shortness of breath, that are, like, you know, the 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 bread and butter of of the Narkovsky. I did also two more exams. Uh, one is called Casper, which okay. is uh, an exam that they request for to to apply. This is Kachiwa in Manitoba. For this Casper, I prepare, uh, I had a very short preparation period, like about two weeks, but I read this uh, book called Vimo's Ultimate Guide for Casper. You can okay. find it in Amazon. It's uh, very useful. And I did also the BC CAP. Uh, it's also called Clinical Assessment Program. It's something similar to the Narkovsky, but the difference is like more ethics uh, focused. So for that, I did two important things. One was uh, I read a, a book called um, Doing Right. I'm not sure if you're familiar. I, it's uh, it's, a, it's an ethical book. And yeah. uh, I, I, get, I, I, I got very familiar with the Kammer Bowl. 
So read uh, at the Royal College website, uh, you can read all the kind of roles and, and understand what they are for and understand how can you reflect them on your answer. So I think that was very helpful for me and the VC cap. Wow, that's like, you, so we have really like similar experiences. I also like did all those exams. Yeah, I wanna like just like, <laughs> yeah. like uh, so, so this is like, uh, guys, like uh, first like, Disclaimer, we are not like getting any funds or any support from any of the books or resources or like courses we are talking about. We are just like sharing our experience. The second thing, I, I just want to like agree with you. I think like for the NAC, Oski, uh, what helped me the most is like having partners and um, practicing a lot with many people. Like people uh, better than you, people like beginners, people at, at your same level. So practicing a lot, I think, yeah, like meeting a lot other international liquid graduates who are trying to write the exam it's very important so just to recap like you wrote to mccq1 you wrote the nac oski and i think you also wrote the mccee or no no i did not i did not okay. have to uh by the time that i did a qa1 you didn't require that it was just up to you and i i didn't want it to yeah, yeah. so the nac oski the mccq1 and you also wrote like the Casper and the BC exam, specific exams. Um, did you like, you read a book for MCCQE2, but did you take the MCCQE2 before applying to residency or no? No, I did not. Um, that was my plan if I did not match. Um, would have been like taking the USMLEs and the MCCQE2, which I think it gives you an, an extra point uh, for, for applying that I, I did not get to that yet. Oh, okay. And like for resources you use, like you work at a question bank, Toronto Notes, the BMO, uh, book for the Casper and doing right. And you familiarize with sell, yourself with the CAN networks. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's a lot. It's worth. <laughs> it was a lot of, uh, it was two years of good, good studying. But yeah, yeah. It worth it. <laughs> great job, great job. And just to like confirm, like you did not try to SMLEs before your residency, eh? No, I did not uh, try them. I think uh, I would I would have liked to, but I just didn't find the time to do that and then get familiarized with, with the Canadian system. I think it would have been my next step. And I do recommend for all IMGs who who are planning to to apply to to get them in, in your back pocket. I think they're very useful. And I think uh, you have to always have a plan B. Mm -hmm. Yep, I totally agree with you. So we finished the med school, we wrote the exams, but like we have to know people. People like have to know us too. How did you gain the experience? What did you do on observership or on elective? Which here, like I should like just clarify an observership it's like non-official you don't get to do hands-on experience it depends also on your preceptor and elective it's more like university to university you talk to each other and you get more hands-on experience and you have the, the chance to do like uh, procedures or you be more active on the world so which one did you do yeah so uh electives as you said that they they have more hands-on experience i unfortunately did not have the opportunity to do that because in my school uh, in Mexico, we don't have uh, connections with North America. Mm -hmm. um, and so all the electives you have to do them in Mexico. Yeah. Um, so when I came here, I did only observerships. And how I got them, it was a very hard process at the beginning because uh, getting, getting somebody to read your emails is just hard. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Did, I did send plenty of emails and I did uh, call plenty of offices and I started by family medicine because I felt that uh, family doctor is more independent, they, they have their own clinic and they have a little less, uh, you know, uh, policies, whereas in a hospital you have to go through all these policies. So I went first to family doctors and I, I just knock all the clinics, you know, I knock doors and I went to all the clinics and until one of them said yes. But I had plenty of notes prior to that. Mm. Uh, this doctor was uh, very helpful to me. He not only accepted me for over a year of observership, but he did uh, help me connect to his peers. So I was very honest with him. I told him I, I want to be an internal medicine physician. Um, and so if you have any internal medicine 
organizations that, that you can connect me with, uh, that'd be great. And so he did connect me with a respirologist and with a general internal medicine. When I went there, I did my, my other uh, when I did my other observations with, with this in general trauma medicine and respirologists, they connected me with more people. So it's just like being honest and tell them like, I'm looking for this. Uh, how can you help me? Because uh, I, I, I have limited uh, people that I know. And so if you can tell me if there's any, anybody else, I, I, yeah, that would be very helpful. And so I found that people are very open when you're honest with them and when, when they see that you're highly motivated. And I feel that that's what helped me get all the observerships. In total, I, I had seven observerships, six of them in internal medicine subspecialties, and one of them in, in family medicine. And with this family medicine doctor, I, I approached him and asked him if I could do just a simple research uh, looking into cardiovascular risk. And he agreed. Uh, in that research, I presented it at the CCC, uh, Canadian Cardiovascular conference, which helped me get more um, networking and, and meet more cardiologists. Wow. Wow. That's inspiring. So yeah, like uh, electives are not like for me, I, I didn't do electives as well because like when I came here, I was like graduated. Uh, I already graduated uh, back from Syria and I didn't have the chance to do electives. But just like you, I had to knock a lot of doors and like uh, I always like emphasis this on, uh, on my interviews. Um, it's not easy, but it's doable. You're gonna knock a lot of doors. You're gonna send a lot of emails uh, until you yes. get response, but you still can get response. And I yeah, think and this is like uh, an example of that. Yeah, I think it's not easy to get the no's, but once you get the yes, it's it's uh, it's easy to start networking from them. It's just uh, it's just a matter of being motivated, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit about like the research and the publication? It's so interesting, like how the family doctor helped you to get into cardiology research and like congratulations on presenting that on the CCC. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I, I did have some research previously to coming into Canada. I've mm. always wanted to be a cardiologist since I was in second year in uh, med school. And so I did work at the Heart Institute uh, of, my, of my city, did some <laughs> research back then. And then when I came here, I presented this to, to my doctor, to the doctor, family doctor and told him, you know, uh, I've done this, this and this. And I feel that it, it will be very interested to know what the, cause he, cause he had a lot of uh, immigrant community. So I told him it would be very interesting to know if the immigrant community have the same knowledge of, of their cardiovascular risk and how to handle it. Like for instance, if a patient who has diabetes, do they know, uh, how important it is to have diabetes under control? Do they know um, how important it is to have the hypertension under control and all these things? Because uh, I think the main issue here in Canada uh, will be that many of these resources that we have are not translated in all the languages. Mm -hmm. So he really liked that idea. And we did uh, uh, a study of how, what were the most common myths more prevalent myths in, in the community. So for instance, if a patient who is diabetic thinks that insulin would get them blind, uh, that's a very common myth in the immigrant community. So I published that uh, as, a, as a poster paper. Uh, I sent it to the CCC and they accepted it. And so I was very happy. Uh, yeah, uh, they, they found it very, uh, very interesting. And, and then I went and, and, and presented it in, in front of, of many physicians. After my presentation, um, I started networking with the people who have heard. And one of them offered me to, to do some research with them. So I ended up doing research in Queens uh, University uh, with, with a cardiologist on in Lyme carditis. In Queens University, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's how I got uh, the research that I did on, on the family medicine um, clinic and also Lyme carditis uh, research at Queens University. Yeah, so that, that was my only Canadian research experience. And prior to that, as I said, I've, I've done that in, in Mexico. 
but while I was doing my exams, uh, I wanted to get like more up to date research. So I went to Mexico for three months just to get more up to date research and, and publish something else. So I did. I did many uh, research. I, th I think that's my passion. I really like to do research um, and I hope to co continue to do so after, you know, after I finish uh, residency and I'm a staff because it's very important for a physician to, to have, you know, just evidence-based uh, practice. Um, so if you guys, you know, if, 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 if you're an IMG, I feel like the first thing that you have to look for is observership and research during those observerships. Wow, that's really interesting. So like, just to recap, so like in Mexico, you had your own research idea. And then when you came here, you worked with this family doctor. And from his own practice, you were able to choose patients, immigrant population, and ask them specific questions about like their knowledge about the risk factor for heart disease. And mm -hmm. then you got the results, you wrote the paper, you sent it to the CCC, and they, it was accepted. So yeah. like yeah. you work on this, like it was your idea, you gathered the data, you wrote the paper, you said, this is really like, so th th this is really nice. I'm just like trying to clarify that because like people, when we talk about research, they think about like big projects and you know, like you have to spend like thousands of hours. And even me, like when I th think about research, I get like overwhelmed, oh my God, like I have like no idea what to do and stuff like, but like, this is a great example of like how just a simple idea, asking question, having a population from a family practice, like not even a big, uh, like a hospital or something. And they're like getting the results, writing about it. It was accepted in CCC, like this is amazing. Yeah, I mean, you also have to, you know, figure out uh, what, what that, that they give you consent and to explain the patients, what are you doing with that information, yeah. which yeah. is very important. Um, but otherwise, I mean, a very small idea can become your, your, your door to, to something bigger. So I feel like it's just, you don't need a lot of money. I didn't, I didn't put any of my money to the research. It was just a oh. database and just talking to patients and things that I, that I had on hand. Yeah, but also you have to have like somebody who supports you. And I, I find that in, in that doctor that was very helpful to me. That's really inspiring. So, um... We talk about the research, we talk about the publications and like we touch base about med school. But after doing this, what did you do next? So you mean like um, more like observerships? Oh, well, um, after like observerships. Like something right? outside of medicine, tell me what did you do? Or like, so, so it, it took you, it, it looks like you graduated in 2017 and then like you, were in med school, uh, sorry, so you ended up in residency around like 2020. So extracurricular things, volunteering or like whatever extracurricular things you did. Can you tell me a bit about this? Yeah, so prior to coming into Canada, I did a lot of volunteering in Mexico. Um, most of my volunteering was focused on helping underserved communities. Um, mm -hmm. One of them was uh, uh, St. Vincent's community they call it. Uh, it's a uh, it's a very underserved community that, uh, and and there's a company there that helps people or ladies, uh, women that are pregnant, or women that have very uh, small children, and they help them uh, to get a place to stay. They help them to get medical attention, and they help them to get dressed and, and food. Um, and they, I, I, what I did there was help uh, raise funds for it. What they do is usually uh, do events, lotteries, or selling, uh, selling um, used clothes. Here, like a Salvation Army kind of thing. Um, when I came here into Canada, I wanted to do some volunteering as well. And so I joined the Red Cross. Uh, nice for a few months um, and I, I work uh, in Mills and Wills. That was such a fun place to be. Um, every day I would go uh, and, and give meals to, to elder population, but it's not all, all, it's not giving the meals only, it's just getting a checkup and see if, if, the, if the patient is okay, if the person is okay, if they need anything, because most of the elderly population here live alone. And so you will help them with their mail, you will help them with uh, 
bringing stuff in, things like that, which is very nice to me. Um, and that was the only uh, volunteering that I did here. And in, in Mexico, as part of our medical school, we also have to go uh, to immunization in underserved communities. Okay. So we will go uh, to vaccinate uh, children around communities and you will walk for kilometers and kilometers for the whole day, uh, knocking doors and, and immunizing uh, children, which was a very good experience as well. I really like that. Wow. wow. Yeah. Um, and other, um, I guess outside of volunteering, the other, I did work in, in telemedicine, which was a job. Um, and that actually helped me like understand a little bit more of the referral system, of the Canadian medical system, of the prescription system. And so that, that actually helped a little bit more being more familiar with the system. And, and I feel that that was uh, a very good point in the, in, the, in the application that they liked. Nice. I hope this will be helpful for other people who are listening to us and they are, um in the pathway of like finding um volunteering opportunities so, so there are plenty and everyone have their own story they have their own um experience in volunteering and helping the community which i think we uh i feel like we have to do um because it's part of us being a human before being doctors or residents or yeah so this is so nice and out of the exams the research the experience the volunteering like out of all this like what do you think like help you the most like to get into residency is there like can you rank them or like do you think like there are two or three factors are more important tell me like what do you think it's it's important it's it's hard to think point one one thing that it's more important i feel like uh, when they see your CARMS application they are deciding whether to give you an interview or not they will see the whole picture and so the whole package and you have to come across as a as a well-rounded individual, as a well-rounded candidate that understands what the Canadian system uh, is. Um, and that can happen in observerships, that can happen in telemedicine, that can happen in volunteering. Uh, obviously, if you have research, it, it will come across as somebody who's very um, uh, scholar, very academic, and they will like that. I feel that research is more important in, in, in special research of internal medicine than family medicine, but don't quote me on that, maybe I'm wrong. Um, but the other thing that I feel it's very important, it's a letter of recommendation. So you have to be able to, somebody has to be able to talk about you and, yeah. and, and, yeah. and have a very good impression of you of how did you work and the letters of recommendation have to come in a certain um, um they, they have to talk about your clinical skills they have to talk about how you are as a person how you are as a professional and if the doctor that that you work with likes you then uh, then they'll do that if not they will give you such a not so good letter of recommendation so it's very important that you come across as a motivated individual, um, a goal-getter, and a very smart person. So I feel like letters of recommendation are very important. Um, and it, they are important to be in the specialty that you're requesting. So if you send in trial medicine letters of recommendation to family medicine, they might not, uh, they might think that you are not wanted really in family medicine, but you're using it as a second option. So it's important that if you're applying to family, there's some recommendation from family doctors. If you're applying to internal medicine, there's some recommendation from internal medicine doctors who can speak a little bit more about whether or not you are a fit for that specialty. Um, I think, yeah, I, 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 I don't see like one particular, I'm sorry, <laughs> I cannot like pinpoint yeah, yeah, I totally one thing. I totally agree with you. There is no single factor, yeah. Yeah, but I feel like, you know, like having a little bit of everything and uh, following the calendar rules when exactly. you do your 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 application, it's very important. Yeah, I think like the letters of reference is something also like I touched base on in my previous interviews. Uh, like having like again like when we come here uh, as an international medical graduate, we always have that idea that oh our scores are very important. If I don't score high, I'm screwed up. Like yeah, like scores exams are important, but like they are not the end of the world. 
having other things in your application is really important. Like people, like at the end of the day, it's rarely that there is diagnosis that can't be reached or they can't find, like most of medicine that we see in the hospital, the thing is the bread and butter. And what they want from an applicant is like someone who can stay late, come early, do the work, not complain, be happy, and try like not to spread any negative energy here and there. So I think the <laughs> preference is really important. Yeah. And again, uh, the whole package. Sorry, go ahead. No, yeah, I, I agree with you. I feel like uh, being collegial and, and being uh, optimistic and, and re resilient are qualities that they require. And I do remember uh, one of the uh, one of the things that 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 was important is that I I I, I had that preparation. So so you have to be able to prepare yourself for residency. And I I think in my case I did a broad based internship for a year where I had calls of 36 hours non sleep. And so I did. I didn't know going to. And so if you had an opportunity to go back home and do an internship, that will look very good in your in your in your curriculum, and that will give you like that uh, image of being somebody who's re resilient and somebody who can handle uh, stress and and wellness. Nice. Yeah. So. We prepare the CV, we prepare the package, we do observerships, electives, exams, research, publication, but now become the biggest interviews. Tell me, how was it? Like, how did you prepare? Like, uh, how, how did you find the interview season? Like, what did you do? And what do you think, like, help you in the interviews? I, I feel like uh, I did prepare a lot for the interviews. I prepared for about three weeks or two weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. Just because, oh. um, just because I am I am very nervous all the time, and so <laughs> when they ask me questions, I can just freeze and not answer yeah. anything. <laughs> and so uh, I think the first thing that I did was uh, looking for YouTube videos on how to get an interview in residency, and most of them are focused on the U.S. system, but they're very very. Um, use, useful for Canadian system as well. Um, so just getting that those questions in YouTube and trying to come up myself with a with a sincere, honest answer for me, I think that was very helpful. Um, the other thing that I cannot stress enough is uh, be very familiar with the calendar roles and try yeah. to try to answer uh, in that role. You know in kind of putting them in, in there and showing that you are professional, you are an advocate, you're a scholar, because that's very important uh, in this system. Um, the other thing that it's very important, I researched the program extensively. Um, mm -hmm. I, I did, I went to the website, I met with residents in the program, I asked questions of the program, um, so be sure that when you are going to interview, you have set questions that you're going to ask yeah. to the program. Because the last part of the interview is always, do you have any questions for us? Sit in and none of the generic questions, such as, uh, I don't know, um, you don't want to ask like, uh, uh, how much are you going to pay me or things like that. You, you want to ask something like more more interesting, like how, what kind of research do you, do you have access for in R1s? Um, I understand, uh, like for example, uh, CBD was new uh, in the last two years. So I asked something about it, like how, how is that affecting the, the learning of residents? Things like that. So you, you have to, to come across or something, somebody who is really interested in the program, which I was. Uh, so very, make sure that you, that you very, very, you do a, a good homework and a good research. And I guess it's just practice. Um, you don't want to practice as much that you sound robotic, but you want to practice as much that you're not nervous enough and that you're more, a little bit more confident with your answers. And so just after all, you just be yourself and have fun. Uh, the interviews here are very nice. People yeah, are very I mean, friendly. I mean. Uh, 
they are not going they're they they're not after you they they don't want you to fail everybody wants you to succeed so just have fun be yourself and and be confident on, on who you are and what you've built up yeah i totally agree with you i think like i'm just going to touch on two things like you said one is the cameraman roles like many people when they go to interviews like they're not not be familiar with the cameraman roles like cameraman roles it's really important it's like uh it's umbrella of characteristics of uh, a physician should have uh, here in Canada. Uh, there are guidelines and criteria that uh, we as physicians should meet. So knowing those uh, roles and what they are and how to um, have a story about each role. I think like all of us, when we come like from uh, different countries to Canada, like to try to match prison, we all have different stories. We all have different experiences, but yes, we have them. So reading about the Canmen roles and see what from your personality or what from your stories fit into each role and presenting your story in a nice way, it's really important. And something else like researching the program, uh, because like it's not only about matching, it's matching in the right place. It's like getting married to a person for three to five years. So it's not, if you're not happy, if you can't fit there, uh, don't go there, like, because like, it's not an easy process. You are, the, the program is not only interviewing you, you are interviewing them as well. So read about the program, find out like what every, like every program have their, their good things and bad things, like see what they are good at and uh, what they are bad at. Is this something that you can live with? Is this something that you can work on or like, so searching about the programs, I think it's also very important. Just knowing the city, knowing the program, and the characteristic of uh, the program that you want to match to. So yeah, yeah. I totally agree with you. Okay. And I feel that the last thing, uh, I'm sorry, that yeah, the well, last thing to say uh, <laughs> from the interviews, it's they will always ask, and I think in every interview, work related or residency related, they will always ask, what do you bring to the program? So be sure that, that that's something that is actually truthful honest and that it's original because many people will say well i did a lot of research yeah but many candidates have done so so yeah. maybe be more specific of what kind of research or be more specific of what what do you bring to the program because that's a very important question yeah yeah i agree and uh, during this process like uh, was there like any uh, or were there any organizations or organization help you like uh, to guide you, to give you some help and tell you what to do next, or like review your CV or your personal statement. Um, was there any help? Yeah, so when I first came here, I had no idea um, of anything, uh, the requirements okay. of the, the exam. So the organization that I went to, it's called Health Force Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, and they actually have classes uh, that tell you which exams you need, which, uh, what, um, what experience do you need? Um, and they're very helpful in that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, I did use them only for maybe a few months. Then after that, I did my own research. I'm, a, I'm an internet geek. I love to go websites and websites and websites. So if you just Google Canada IMGs, uh, you will find a lot of information. Um, and I feel that that was my, my way of getting uh, across and my way of, of, of answering my own questions. And after that, all the physicians that I uh, observed with were IMGs. So that was very helpful because uh, they will answer all my questions pretty much. And I was the kind of person that asked a lot of questions. You, you must know me already. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I feel like that's what's very helpful. But uh, the, only, the only one that I used was that one. And for the NACOS, as I said, the Ontario IMG school was very helpful as well, which is led by an IMG position as well yeah yeah uh asking a lot of questions like knocking doors like the door that doesn't open you haven't lost anything but the doors that open like you gain a lot from it for sure yeah, yeah. yeah i had a lot of physicians tell me like no it's because you're an img and i cannot take you okay well next one and next one and next one yeah. until somebody said yes yeah, I think oh, like this is something that's based on when international medical graduates come here, like we, like they hear and we hear, I would say, I, I, I will say like we hear a lot of like negative voices coming from here and there. Well, like here, yeah, the match rate is not that high, but for international medical graduates, but people are doing it. And 
the ones who are getting to residency are the ones who are doing it right. So that's why I created this channel to help like many people as possible and to know like what other people are doing and uh, what are the characteristics, like what you want to do for when you're applying for different specialties. So yeah, I agree with you. Thank you, Ropin. That's a, that's a sure. great thought. Yeah. And, and I feel like uh, that, that was the reason that I wanted to interview it. This is, this is such a good help. And I wish I had that when I was an IMG uh, applying for this. This is very helpful. Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. my pleasure. Okay, so I think we are done. Um, anything else do you want to add before we finish? I think uh, the last thing might be apply broadly, apply everywhere, because um, mm -hmm. you never know uh, where is your your ideal city. So yeah. I feel like uh, apply it everywhere that you can will be the last advice, I guess. All right, all right, everyone, and thank you very much for. Uh, uh, watching us and we will see you on the next episode. Take care.